And I said, I'd be glad to. Now, this is true. She handed me six books written by Josh McDowell. <laughs> so, I signed Josh McDowell's name in every book and gave them all back to her. And to this day, she probably thinks Josh McDowell came to her store. Every year uh, at Christmas time, we've been doing this for a number of years. I love New York. I love it especially at Christmas time, and I try to go there every year if I can. I can't always do it, but I save up my travel miles, and we go there, and, and uh, we go to the Radio City Music Hall and some other things. Well, we had an anniversary at Shadow Mountain a, a couple years ago, and our congregation knows of my propensity to go to New York, and so they decided to give us a special gift. And uh, we, we wanted to take our family this, this year, so they they paid for two stretch limos for the whole week. A white one and a black one. I mean the long babies, these real long things, you know. And I thought that was so cool, you know, we could go around New York and then I started to think, what if somebody sees me and recognizes me, here I'm riding around in this limo, I'm gonna perpetuate the idea of televangelist and will never recover. <laughs> so I, I really secretly prayed, Lord, just let us do this in anonymity, nobody's gonna watch, nobody's gonna see. And we made it all the way to the last day. We went to a Broadway play and we were coming back to the hotel. We got in the elevator and I saw this guy looking at me and I knew I was in trouble. And as the elevator started up, he said, you know what? He said, you look just like a guy I watch on television named David Jeremiah. And I said, you know what? That's probably because that's who I am. Just then we got to his floor, the door opened, he walked out and he turned around and he said, no, you're not. So, I attend the National Religious Broadcasters Convention every year, and uh, I don't always do this, but I sometimes like to walk through the exposition because they have all these people there that are doing all this stuff, you know, and I was with some of my friends and we were walking, I heard somebody hollering, hey, wait, hey, wait, and I looked back and this little lady was coming just as fast as her legs would carry her right toward me, and she got right up to me and she got right in my face and she said, oh, Dr. Stanley, I am so glad to meet you. <laughs> So my experience involves somebody thinks I'm Josh McDowell, somebody else thinks I'm Charles Stanley, and somebody's not sure who I am. <laughs> but I love doing what I do. I've been doing this for quite a while. I should report to you that my wife Donna and I just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. And, uh, <laughs> we, are, we are blessed, as I was telling your pastor, I just am so thankful that God lets me do what I do. I, I just love to do what I do. Uh, people ask me all the time, Jeremiah, what do you do? And I tell them I study the Bible and I read the Bible and I preach the Bible and I broadcast the Bible and I televise the Bible, write books about the Bible, study guides about the Bible. That's what I do. That's really all I know how to do. If I couldn't do that, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But I am blessed that the Lord lets me do that and thank you all for being here tonight. I'm honored by your presence. For the last two years, maybe a little bit longer than that, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the conditions in our world. But I have to tell you, I was taken back by the headlines that came to me recently in an opinion column by Israeli journalist Ethan Haber. It blared, what World War III has started. That was the title of the article. Haber was writing about the success of North Korea's nuclear program and he warned that the test missile fired by the North Koreans landed squarely in the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem. What he meant by that was it could not any longer be ignored that this superpower was aggressively moving forward. The world, it seems, is quickly moving toward a point of no return. Haber suggested, especially when it comes to the Middle East, experts believe the Iran-North Korean nuclear axis is now stronger than it was when it started in 2008. North Korea appears ready to supply nuclear weapons in exchange for subsidized oil from a nuclearizing nation that is threatening to destroy Israel. You all know that. You know what I'm talking about. Men and women, it seems like every day there is something in the news that reminds us of the perilous times in which we live. Even the fires which we experience here so routinely in Southern California remind us that we are not in control of our own destiny that we live in a dangerous world and in dangerous times. As a Christian, I might be tempted to be afraid, maybe even to be in despair. But the Word of God will not let me go there. 
Because when I open the pages of the Word of God, I find God's instructions, not only to me, to all of us, as we face these uncertain days. In Romans chapter 13, in verse 11, there is a verse with a clarion call from the Lord to be ready for His return. In this verse, we find a clear strategy for living proactively every day, right now. As appalling things transpire around us, we don't have to be affected in our spirit. No weapon on earth can blast this verse out of the Bible. These words tell us how to respond internally and even internationally to the times in which we are living. Before I unpack these verses, I want to express to you how important they have become to me. Back in, 19, back in 2008, I wrote a book called What in the World is Going On? It's the most read book I have written. And I have been asked to sign a lot of copies. And I always sign my name, David Jeremiah, Romans 13, 11. Here is what Romans 13, 11 through 14 tells us about how we should respond in the day in which we live. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In words terse and blunt, you might say Paul's message is, live like you were dying. That phrase, as many of you know, was Tim McGraw's choice for the title of a song that he recorded some years ago. It was the best, one of the best songs he ever recorded, and it did very well on the charts. And In part, the lyrics go like this. I loved deeper. I spoke sweeter. I gave forgiveness. I'd been denying. Someday I hope you get to live like you were dying. I remember when that song came out, right about at the same time as it happened, Carnegie Mellon University professor Randy Pausch was invited to be the speaker at an ongoing series asking thoughtful lecturers to assume that they were giving their last presentations before death and to lecture as if they were dying. It turned out that after he got the invitation, he found out that in reality he was dying. He had pancreatic cancer at the age of 47 and he delivered an unforgettable talk that became a book that sold more than 10 million copies it was called the last lecture the country singer and the university professor hit a common chord and that chord is the importance of living on purpose of moving through life with a sense of urgency based on something higher than just the pursuit of pleasure if this was important to them, how much more should it be important to us who call ourselves followers of Christ? If ever there was a time for the church of God and the people of God to catch the sense of urgency, this is the time. Southern evangelist Vance Havner seems to have captured our laid-back approach to life when he writes, The devil has chloroformed the atmosphere of this age. We need to take down our do not disturb signs, snap out of our stupor, come out of our coma, and awake from our apathy. From the pages of scripture written so long ago, that alarm has never ceased. Calls us to get past the reverie of what we're gonna watch on TV tonight, or who's doing what in the NBA playoffs. We can almost hear the voice of Jesus in the garden one night when he came to find his disciples and said to them, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Behold, the hour is at hand. Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, gives us four things we can do as we sit in the midst of all of these changing scenarios of life. You know, as you get older, you get a little more perspective on things. I remember, and I tell my kids sometimes, how it used to be back when I was their age. And they just look at me, you know, like I'm a, a relic of the past. <laughs> but in the age of my lifetime, I was born in 1941. 
to where we are right now, more things have changed in our, in our, in our world than changed in all of the other years prior to 1941. Change is so incredibly fast right now. It's almost more than you can absorb. And as believers, we're caught up in it. All of us, we're caught in the changes. If we're not careful, we let those changes wear us down until we become more and more like the things that we're supposed to be separate from. So I want you to listen carefully to what Paul said to the Romans because they were living in a time very much like ours, under the rule of the Roman Empire. Here's what Paul says we are to do. Number one, we are to watch vigilantly. Romans 13, 11, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Throughout the Bible, we are told we're to know the times and the seasons. In the Old Testament, there was a group in Israel that was appointed for that very purpose. First Chronicles 12, 32 says, the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. There was a special group in, in, the, in the community of Israel who were devoted to studying the times and to give instructions so that Israel knew how to respond to the times in which they were living. One of the reasons we have prophecy conferences like this one is so that we can have discernment about what's happening in our world so that we know what to do. Most of the things we're facing, the things that we don't truly understand, men and women, these are things the Bible tells us we're going to happen. We may be surprised by them, but God isn't. We may be taken aback by the things that are happening as uh, things wax worse and worse, but Almighty God told us it would be there. If we would just read our Bibles, some of this stuff wouldn't take us by such surprise. When you get to the New Testament, you hear the Lord Jesus Christ scolding, literally scoring the people to whom he was speaking. He said to them, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Matthew 16, 3. Jesus said, you guys know how to do the weather better than you know how to do the Bible. You, you can look at the skies and say, well, it looks like it's going to rain today, but you don't, have enough, uh, you don't have enough initiative to look in the Bible and say, it looks like Jesus might be coming soon. I've been watching the news as you have about all the fires, and they're, pr they're pr telling you which way the wind's going to blow, where the smoke's going to go, are the fires and the, and the humidity and how, how it is. Everybody, they're talking all about this, and they're helping us to understand what's going to happen. Guess what? Most of what they said was going to happen is happening. But the Bible is filled with truth from Almighty God telling us what's going to happen, and we don't even take time to figure out that it's important. I cannot tell you how many times I have had other pastors come up to me and say to me, Jeremiah, I can't believe you spent time teaching prophecy. It is totally irrelevant. And I'm telling them something different these days. I'm saying, well, just hang on. It's getting more relevant all the time, you know? <laughs> Every day that you wake up, it's more relevant than it was the day before. In fact, there is not anything in the Bible more relevant than Bible prophecy. If you study Bible prophecy almost without exception, every time there's a major prophecy, Jesus tells us what we're to do because of that. Therefore, how pure we ought to be. He says, knowing the times, this is what you should do. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, in John 14, he said, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. How should I live in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back soon? I shouldn't let my heart get troubled. Every time you open the book, every time you crack it open to a prophetic passage, there's the prophecy about the future and Almighty God saying, and this is what this means to you right now. So don't let any wag tell you that the Bible is full of prophecy that is not relevant to today. We need to understand that much of the Bible is prophetic. And to ignore it is to cut half of the Bible out of your life. I am so proud of this church for hosting a conference on biblical prophecy. Give yourselves a big hand tonight. There's so many people that laugh at the very thought that you could predict the future from the Bible. <clears throat> You've probably read <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You've heard this as I have. Well, you know, you people are always talking about Jesus is going to come back. People have been talking about Jesus coming back for many, many years, and he hasn't come back yet. What do you say about that? Well, let me tell you what the Scripture says about it. 
for now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. <laughs> Amen? What can I tell you for sure about Jesus' return? I can't tell you when or where, but I can tell you this. It's closer than it was when I got saved. His coming is nearer than it's ever been. When we speak of the eminence of Christ's return, we're not talking about chronological order. We're talking about a season. We're speaking of the fact <coughs> that everything is ready. There's no reason it couldn't happen today. The rapture could happen without one single thing taking place. There is no sign that must take place before the rapture. There are many signs about the second advent. And many of those signs are being fulfilled, which means, listen to me, if there are no signs for the rapture and it's seven years before the second advent and there are signs for the second advent, what does that mean about the rapture? It's even closer than you think. Future events cast their shadows before them. And these shadows coming from the second advent are cast all the way back to the time right before the rapture. When we begin to see the things the Bible talks about with intensity and frequency, you can count on it. We're getting close. I don't believe it's much longer. Ann and I were talking at dinner tonight that we expect to be here when the Lord returns. I tell everybody all the time, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> If you want to have a good answer for people who ask you, when is the Lord coming back? Just tell them. I don't know, but it's sooner than it used to be. <laughs> you will always be accurate when you answer that question. We're to be watching. We're to be reading our papers. We're to be listening to the news through the grid of the Word of God. We know what the Word of God says, and then we see these events, and we see how they fit into what God says is His plan. When Paul uses the word salvation, he says, now is your salvation nearer than it was before? Don't let that confuse you because some of you are going to say, what do you mean my salvation is nearer? I've been saved for a long time. My salvation is in the past. But in the Bible, if you study the Bible, you'll discover that salvation has three tenses. It has a past, a present, and a future. Let me see if I can un unravel that a little bit. In the past, my salvation, we say yes to Christ. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our sins are forgiven. I have been saved saved. In the present, the ongoing growth process of my life is happening. Molecule by molecule, my spiritual life is being conformed to the image of Christ. So I can actually say, I am being saved. One day, I'm going to stand before the Lord and be made just like him, and the Bible says, I will be saved. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. Here's a good way to remember it. In the past, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. In the present, I am being saved from the power of sin. And in the future, I will be saved from the very presence of sin. I have been saved. I am being saved. And what Paul is talking about here is that third one. He's saying the salvation, the salvation from the presence of sin, it's drawn nigh. It's coming. It's going to be here. It's nearer than when you first believed. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English Victorian preacher, was one day speaking about the apathy in the church in his day. And he made a point I will not soon forget. He said, you can sleep but you cannot induce the devil to close his eyes. The prince of the power of the air keeps his servants well up to their work. If we could, with a glance, see the activity of the servants of Satan, we would be astonished at our own sluggishness. We need to be watching vigilantly, watching for the return. I had a story that somebody told me years ago. I used to, I lived in the Midwest, I grew up uh, not very far away from Winona Lake, Indiana. And there was a Bible conference there. And one day, um, a lady was in this Bible conference, and Robert E. Lee was preaching, one of the great preachers. And he was preaching on the term Maranatha, which I thought of coming here. The Lord is coming. Maranatha, the Lord comes. And uh, he, he walked out of the service that night, and the lady walked up to him and said, Good job, preacher. Marijuana. She didn't get the right word. The Lord is coming, and we're to be watching for his coming. Do you think about that when you see these things happening? What does this mean in terms of the Lord's return? Uh, Paul says to us, awake out of your sleep. Be vigilant. Watch for the times of the times. Notice the second thing he tells us. We are not only to watch vigilantly, we're to war valiantly. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, 
let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. All of this because the Lord is coming. What does Paul mean when he says put off darkness? I'm going to do a little preaching now. When Paul tells us to put off darkness, he chooses a word that means to deliberately, purposefully, significantly, and permanently put things out of your life. Darkness is the term that is used to describe what you were like before you were saved. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul tells us, listen to me, that the Lord's return is imminent and we should not let the old nature have any inroads into our lives. He is warning us that while Christ is accepted in a moment, sin remains our foe all of our lives. Many followers of Christ are surprised to discover that when they become Christians, their old nature is not eradicated, but it's still present with them. If you do not believe that, Poke your husband or your wife and ask them, is my old nature still with me? And they will tell you. They will help you understand that. Christians have two natures. Before we were saved, we only had one. But once we are saved, the Lord God gives us a new nature. And here's a simple way to remember how these two natures work. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul. The one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. Isn't that the way it works? Can I say that again? Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul, the one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate. But the one I feed will dominate. You want to know why you struggle with your old nature, Christian? It's because you're not spending much time feeding the new nature. You're allowing all the stuff of the world to feed your old nature, and it grows, and it becomes strong, and it gives you grief. You know what you should go on? You should go on this program where you're going to starve the old nature. Don't give him anything that he can use uh, to get a foothold in your life. The old nature is still present with you, even though you're a Christian, but thank God he's given us a new nature, and when we yield to the Holy Spirit and we feed the new nature, we can be victorious over all that is around us. We don't have to be victimized. We can be victors. Hallelujah. Romans tells us that we're to put off the darkness. And he's reminding us that every victory over sin makes us stronger. Did you know that every time you gain a victory over the enemy in your life, it strengthens you? And every time you yield, it weakens you. You may think, well, this is not that important. I know I should do this, but it's not that. Every little thing is important. Everything you do in response to Almighty God strengthens you on the inward part of your life. And when you become careless as a Christian and allow sin to come into your life and, and reside comfortably in your, in your being, you're just weakening and weakening and weakening the part of you that God so wants to treasure. Put off the darkness. And then he says, put off the darkness and put on the light. Paul is using the New Testament picture for walking in fellowship. Have you remember that verse in 1 John 1, 7? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I have been told scientifically that there is no such thing as darkness. That darkness is simply the term that we use to describe the absence of light. When we are walking in the light, darkness has no chance. It will flee. But when you allow darkness in your life, little by little, the light is not as dominant as it was. You feed the old nature, and the old nature thrives. You feed the new nature, and the new nature thrives. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul, the one is blessed, the one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. We're to walk valiantly, war valiantly. And then it says you're to walk virtuously, Romans 13, 13. Let us walk properly as in the day. And then he uses one of his many lists that he always comes to, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, but not in strife or envy. I don't know if you've noticed when you read Paul's epistles, he's got lots of lists. And you look at those lists, and none of them are really complete. He, don't, he doesn't mean them, but they're representative lists. Paul's saying that this is, the way, this is the way the old nature is. The old nature produces these kind of things, and then he'll give you a bunch of them. The new nature produces these kind of things, and he'll give you a bunch of them. 
And here in this text, he's given us a bunch of things that help us understand what it means to walk in the night, not walking in the day. Again, this is not exhaustive, but it gives us a good indication. And if you take this list and kind of divide it up, you'll notice there's two things here. There's public sin and private sin. Drunkenness, partying, lewdness, public sin. Lust, private sin. And Paul says to us, as we're awaiting the return of the Lord, this is not a time for us to become careless in the way we live. This is the time for us to become very careful in the way we live. Don't get caught up in this stuff. You know, I I don't have to tell you this because we all know. We know what we're doing. We know. We have the choice. We make these decisions. We walk into this stuff with our eyes wide open. We go places we know we shouldn't go. We do stuff we know we shouldn't do, and we think somehow it won't matter. Let me tell you something, friends. It matters. It really matters. According to the National Review, Americans rent 800 million pornographic videos and DVDs every year. 800 million. And a vast majority of men between the ages of 18 and 34 frequent pornographic websites every month. And among those who are addicted to pornography are a great number of people who are professing to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, when you do that, that's a proactive decision. You do that. You, you go there and you make that decision. So many, listen to me, so many children of God, blessed benefactors of the blood of Christ and the surpassing love of God are choosing to hand themselves over to a new kind of slavery. We damage the precious minds that God has given us, the very temples where the Holy Spirit dwells. And we do that. We, we make the choice to do it. Did you know the Bible tells you to run from four things? I will never forget this. The Bible usually tells you to stand up and be a man. You know, resist Satan and he will flee from you. Having stood, stand. But four times in the New Testament, we're told to put on our Adidas and get out. (laughs) Idolatry, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Youthful lust, 2 Timothy 2, 22. Materialism, 1 Timothy 6, 17. And sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Notice on that list of four, two of them have to do with sexual impropriety. Flee in morality. You say, well, why does the Bible say you run from that? Because you're no, there's no way you're going to ever win the war. There's no way you're ever going to be able to compete. Do you remember the story of Joseph who went into the house one day when his master was gone and uh, Potiphar's wife was after Joseph and she was trying to seduce him to commit adultery with her? And the Bible says that as he came into the house one day, she grabbed hold of his coat And Joseph ran out, leaving his coat in her hands, and got out of there. And that's when I said, the best piece of equipment you will ever find when it comes to sexual immorality is the best pair of Adidas you can buy. Get out. And Joseph was accused of doing something he didn't do, but he knew in his heart that he had been faithful to God. When I speak to young people all the time, I tell them, you know, your, your, your commitment to spiritual purity has to be determined long before you're in the back seat with some guy. You better know what you believe. You will not be able to ever stand up to the temptation unless you know in your heart what your commitment is to the things of purity, especially in the area of sexuality. And I'm going to tell you right now, the devil has many subtle strategies that he's using on God's people. None is more powerful and destructive than sexual temptation. When I say run from it, I remember one day I was preaching along this line and this guy came up to me and he told me that he was in a situation where he worked and the girl who worked next to him was young and beautiful and vivacious and he had an attraction toward her and he thought she might have an attraction to him. He said, what should I do? I said, either you get another job or make sure she gets another job. He says, well, I can't quit my job. I said, well, let's put it this way. You want to quit your job or ruin your life? You can find another job, but you can't find another life. When you allow yourself to exist in a situation where temptation is present with you all the time to do wrong, you will then ultimately, you will do wrong. Get out. We are to watch vigilantly. We are to war valiantly. And we're to walk virtuously. And then the Bible says in verse 14, we are to wait victoriously. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Maybe as you've listened tonight to me speak, you may be thinking that Paul's expectations are unreasonable and borderline impossible. But all the things he asks us to do are possible. The strength through the Spirit of God and the strategy through the Word of God are ours to have. 
Once we determine to live in the light of the Lord's return, a sense of confidence returns and we are no longer overwhelmed by the chaos of the world around us. Here the Bible says we're to put on Christ. What does that mean? One of my favorite writers who's in heaven now is a guy by the name of Ray Stedman. I had him as a teacher when I was in seminary for a while. And he wrote this about putting on Christ. Listen to these words. He said, when I get up in the morning, I put on my clothes, intending them to be a part of me all day, to go where I go, do what I do. They cover me and make me presentable to others. That is the purpose of clothes. In the same way, the apostle is saying to us, put on Jesus Christ when you get up in the morning. Make him part of your life that day. Intend that he go with you everywhere you go and act through you in everything you do. Call upon his resources. Live your life in Christ. Do not take him places where you will embarrass him. Do you know that wherever we go as followers of Christ, we take the influence of Jesus with us? And we ought to every day get up and pray, Lord God, use me today in such a way. I don't want to be an embarrassment to you today. I want to, I want to honor who you are in my life. And then it says, put on Christ and then make no provision for the flesh. That's an important principle. Let me illustrate what I mean. There's an old Native American saying that goes like this, call upon God and row away from the rocks. <laughs> the idea is put yourself in the best position to succeed as far away from trouble as you can get. Do you know that some people need to erase a few streets from their maps? Some others need to install software to protect their eyes from certain internet destinations. When you're on a diet, you don't want to loiter at an ice cream store. <laughs> I love the story about this guy who was trying to lose weight. His big temptation was donuts, and he used to stop every day at the donut shop and scarf down more than a few. When he went on his diet, he took another route to work, and he got victory over his donut craze. But one morning, a few weeks into his well-publicized diet, one of his friends saw him eating a donut and asked him what had happened. And here's what he said. He said, this morning when I started out for work, I had a huge craving for a donut, and I made a deal with God. I told God that I would drive by the donut shop, and if the parking place right in front was vacant, <laughs> I would know it was all right for me to stop and buy a donut. And he said, sure enough, the eighth time around the block, there it was. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of how we do it, isn't it? We give Satan an inroad into our lives. We, we allow him to get his, his, his hooks into us, and here, here's... You know, I think sometimes if we're not careful, we're always blaming what happens to us on somebody else, or we say, the devil made me do it. You know, the devil can do certain things, but there are many things that the devil has nothing to do with. It's our own carelessness, our unwillingness to be, to be proactive in our Christian experience so that we make decisions to keep him away. And, you know, we do this every day. I, I, I struggle like everybody does as we get older and you're trying to keep your weight down and we have some wonderful people at, at, at Turning Point. who we, we have a lot of luncheons there. I have a lot of luncheons at Turning Point with people who come in. It's a lot easier than going to a restaurant. And so they've been trying to, you know, they've been trying to take really good care of me. So they bring me these beautiful, healthy salads for lunch. And then four of the largest cookies you ever saw in your life. <laughs> so let me tell you what I did. I just did this today. I went to Diane, who's my administrative secretary, and I said, Diane, I want you to do something for me. I said, don't bring me these wonderful, luscious salads and then put four cookies in front of me after I'm done. Don't put the cookies on the table. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes we have to just say, this is an issue for me. I'm not going near that. This is a problem I have. I'm going to stay from that. I'm going to walk virtuously. I'm going to war valiantly. I'm going to live my life proactively for the Lord. That's the opposite of what Paul means by making no provision for the flesh when you allow stuff like that in your life. When you allow stuff to be in your life that can get you in trouble, you're just playing a game you can't win. I love history. And I remember reading the biography of Harry Truman, written by David McCullough. And he tells this story about what happened in Truman's life. He said the president was in the midst of talks with the USSR and Great Britain. And the question at hand was what to do with post-war Germany. There was a great deal of anxiety and stress after one really tough day, according to the Secret Service agent. Truman was ready to head back to his quarters. An Army public relations officer jointly asked him for a ride. Truman, always the down-to-earth type, gave him a seat in the car. 
As a thank you gesture, the stranger offered to get Truman anything he wanted from the city's thriving black market. He suggested a few of the products he dealt with in cigarettes and watches and whiskey and women, especially women with the leering emphasis on women. The smile was gone from Harry Truman's face. He replied, listen, son, I married my sweetheart. She doesn't run around on me and I don't run around on her. And I want that understood. Don't ever mention that kind of stuff to me again. When they arrived at the yellow stucco house for us to use at the conference, Truman said he left the car with no further word to the now humbled officer. He let him leave the car remembering Truman's words. Every day, every one of us in this auditorium has at least one moment where we have to stand up for what we believe is right for us. And every time we take a stand for the good, we build our spiritual muscles. And every time we take a stand of weakness, we allow the enemy more strength in our lives. Don't think those things are incidental. They're not. They're important. Win every little victory, and you will soon be winning all the big ones. Don't wait for the big ones to come along and say, I'll fight on that hill. Fight all of the little ones and win them by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we give our lives to Christ, men and women, he comes to live his life through us, and we learn to be uncomfortable with everything that grieves him. I will never forget, some of you will remember this as well, the first time I saw the film, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, I was invited to a special showing of the film at the Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas. Like most people at that time, we had heard a lot of publicity about it, a lot of controversy about it. We had no idea what in the world to expect. So I remember one day, my friend David and the rest of us, we got on a private jet and we flew to Dallas to go to see the Passion of the Christ for the very first time at the Prestonwood Baptist Church. I'd never seen a film like that in my life. Certainly never anything like that about Jesus. We sat and watched this bloody, gory, graphic depiction of what the Lord Jesus endured for our sin. As we got on the plane that night to come back to California, there was silence among us. Nobody said a word. Each of us with our private reflections and occasionally the sound of some emotion. And I remember that night, men and women, praying this prayer. Lord Jesus, help me to live my life from this moment onward in such a way that I never do anything to hurt you or break your heart. Not after what you've done for me. That's the power of the cross. It stands on that rock at Calvary even today, casting its shadow across an entire planet, across the centuries until it engulfs every one of us with its unquenchable power. To let ourselves experience that cross, to stand weeping before it with Mary and John and the centurion and millions of Christians through the ages is to be radically and entirely changed from the inside out. To catch even a fleeting glimpse of Christ and his incredible love for us is to devote ourselves wholeheartedly to giving him our lives in return. How could we do less than give him our best and live for him forever? It's only because we forget about the cross. We forget about the price that was paid for our redemption. And if we're not careful, we go back and start doing the things that put Jesus on the cross in the first place. And it breaks his heart as it would break your heart if one of your children were to respond to you that way. In another movie of a few years ago, we cover the span of 50 years through a series of flashbacks. Most of you will remember this. The four Ryan brothers have all bravely gone off to fight in World War II. When information surfaced that the other three brothers had died within days of one another, a senior official in Washington, D.C. ordered a special mission to bring Private James Ryan home from the front. Because Ryan's unit is listed as missing in action, it becomes a search mission as well. Now the movie's starting to come back to you. Captain Miller assembles a seven-man rescue squad that succeeds in locating Ryan, but Ryan refuses to leave his unit. Despite the news of the death of his brothers, he will not leave his unit. Most of the men on that mission lose their lives in the effort to save Ryan or in a subsequent battle between Ryan's unit and the enemy forces. As if holding Ryan responsible for the great sacrifice made on his behalf, 
the mortally wounded Captain Miller pulls the stunned private toward him, and with his final breath he says, James, earn this. Earn it. Now the scene flashes forward to the present, where James Francis Ryan, now in his 80s, is seen paying homage to Captain Miller's grave at Omaha Beach in Normandy, France. Overcome with emotion and perhaps some guilt, he says to the grave marker, as if to Miller and the rest, I hope I've earned what all of you have done for me. We all know that we could never, ever merit such a great sacrifice as the Lord Jesus gave us. No one could ever do enough to earn the incredible price of the gift of a rescued life. No gift is ever earned, especially the gift of eternal life. That is the truth about salvation as well. We can never earn it. There is zero mathematical possibility that a sinful life can ever, under any circumstances, make a good exchange for the one perfect and holy life that was ever lived. No way human blood can equate to the blood of God's own Son. So we can't earn it. But what we can do is to know what Christ has done in the past.